Welcome in to another new AMP podcast. I'm your host, Ben DuBose, news editor with the AMP publications team. Today, we're joined by Gregory Muha, director of conferences, exhibits, and sponsorships at AMP. Greg, thanks so much for taking the time. How are you? I'm doing great, Ben. It's good to be with you again this year. Absolutely. And as our listeners can probably surmise by your title, the reason we have Gregory on today is to talk about the upcoming AMP annual conference and expo, which for 2024 will take place in early March in New Orleans, Louisiana. So, Greg, before we get into the specifics about the show, just introduce yourself to our audience and explain how your role touches on this annual show that AMP puts together every year. Sure. So uh, again, I'm Greg Muha, I'm the Director of Conferences, Exhibits, and Sponsorships. And the team that I lead here at AMP, we're responsible for not only not only the annual conference and expo, but all the regional and topical events. And so we partner with other AMP staff across multiple business units and our members across the globe and in various regions to bring together the content, find the exhibitors, and, and put together uh, what is, we believe, to be a valuable gathering of, of AMP members uh, at a neutral forum to really come together and share information, knowledges, best practices, provide that opportunity for idea sharing and networking, product showcases, demonstrations, and you know anything that's you know relevant to the industries that AMP serves in the materials protection and performance space. So to walk everyone through the history, Prior to 2021, there were two legacy associations, NACE International and SSPC, the Society for Protective Coatings. NACE International's legacy show was Corrosion. SSPC's legacy show, the flagship that is, was Coatings Plus. So under the AMP umbrella, this is supposed to combine the interest of those shows, both for corrosion mitigation, as well as protective coatings, put together everything under one roof. Of course, this is our third time doing it under the AMP umbrella, or I believe it's the third time, correct? It is. Okay, that's what I thought, because 2021 was the virtual show for NACE, and SSPC had the last Codings Plus in December, and then 2022 in San Antonio, 2023 in Denver, and now 2024, the third AMP annual, will take place in New Orleans. So beyond it being just a place where AMP members can get together, in terms of the scope of each AMP annual event, what does it encompass? What are the types of topics and people that are brought together each year beyond simply being members? Just speak to the business orientation and the other aspects of it that could be relevant to really the industry at large. Yeah, sure, sure. So, you know, first off, I have to say there's just so many amazing AMP members and volunteers that we collaborate with to create uh, what I believe is a pretty fabulous offering of content that really makes it difficult for our attendees to decide what what they want to attend. Um, They've got some difficult choices to make. And uh, as you mentioned about the legacy associations, you know, regardless of where people came from and, and, you know, as part of AMP, um, there's always familiar topics. And, you know, that includes things like asset integrity management, Transportation and infrastructure is always big. Advanced protective coatings, uh, corrosion management, cathodic protection, a lot on surface preparation, uh, things relative to materials performance, corrosion under insulation, we see quite a bit there. Um, We get a a little bit on passive fire protection and then regulatory and and compliance activities. Those are staples that regardless of, of whether you went to corrosion or coatings plus, you saw portions of that. But as AMP has evolved, and and I think AMP has done a really good job of embracing the past of both organizations, but doing so with an eye toward the future, you know, there's been an injection of some fresh topics and content into the event over the, the, you know, you mentioned 2022 being the first AMP event. Uh, There really has been an injection of new content and, and interest. And, you know, this year in particular, we see some things relative to carbon capture, transportation, utilization and storage, that's becoming a big thing. Um, We've got some interest on artificial intelligence and machine learning. We're seeing some things pop up, our keynotes on that, and I can touch on that a little later. We've got some robotic inspection activities this year in the program, a lot around renewable energy. Um, We've seen a little bit of a bump around military and defense related activities tied to corrosion and coatings. And we're also seeing a little bit of a bump in the non-metallics area. So the one thing we work with the conference and events program committee 
Um, and obviously there's program committees for all the various product areas at AMP, but they do a good job of, of reaching across the aisles, if you will. And so as a, for instance, within the standards program committee, um, they have a connection into the annual conference where all the standard committees come together. And SC12, standard committee 12, one, the, the chairman of CEPC, Stephen Reinstatler from Cavestro, he happens to be active in SC12. And so he was instrumental in working with the standards folks to, to look at some areas where they could bring content into the conference out of what they're doing in the standards area. So as a result of that, you'll see some content this year in the conference tied to the corrosion of reinforced concrete structures. We've got some things around coatings and linings failures, uh, quality assurance and quality control. And we also threw an MOU that was brought in with AWWA. We have some water and wastewater topics this year, uh, some things around hydrogen and emerging fuels. And for the last couple of years, there's been a lot of interest around the FIMSA meta, uh, mega rule. And mm -hmm. so, um, you know, as, as that rule has come into play, uh, while the, the topic's been similar, uh, it changes based on where they're at in implementation. So, Definitely a lot of interest in those areas. And so, again, I just think it's really exciting to see how AMP has embraced the past, has that eye toward the future to help really prepare that next generation of the workforce that's going to be critical to preserving and extending a lifespan of assets and in infrastructure that, you know, most people way too often take for granted. So, you know, thanks to the efforts of these AMP members across the globe, we are able to provide this type of programming that really does contribute to a world built and protected with safe, reliable, and sustainable materials. So I'm, I'm really excited to see how this all comes to play. Um, it's, you know, not the same old, same old. Uh, again, some familiar topics and, and content, but some new ones and, and some expansion of others. Absolutely. Can't wait to get there. There's a lot to look forward to. We'll get into the specifics in just a few minutes, but as we're leading off, I also want to touch on the host city, which this year is New Orleans. I know you all, as our conferences team, try to alternate the event between Gulf Coast locations and other spots throughout the United States. Recent history, San Antonio in 2022, that's a Gulf Coast site. 2023 was Denver. Now we're back to New Orleans. The next few years, Nashville in 2025, Houston in 2026, Columbus in 2027, and I believe San Antonio again in 2028. Is that right? Correct. Correct. Okay. So what does New Orleans offer as a host city that's unique relative to all the others? What's your pitch for why New Orleans is a fun place to go to? I think some of that sort of speaks for itself. Yeah. But beyond that, why is that such a good spot for this industry, for the Gulf Coast location of this event? Yeah, that, that's interesting. I, I mean, number one, it's just it's a destination our constituents really enjoy traveling to. I mean, obviously, the climate's usually favorable. There's many. It's, it's a great foodie town, a lot of great restaurants and eateries, plenty of entertainment, some very unique venues. Uh, as a, for instance, we're actually hosting our honoree night at the World War II Museum, which mm -hmm. is just a fabulous venue. So you, you have those kind of things. And, you know, quite honestly, uh, it's, it's one of those things where um, if you look historically and I have data that goes back to 1994, um, that we look at from, uh, we don't have all the compiled data, but we, we have a fair amount of data that goes back to 94 on registration numbers, number of exhibitors, number of symposia. I mean, it's a limited amount. It's not a full slice and dice. But as I was talking to some of our colleagues and kind of looking at, at the registration numbers and trying to do all the planning and preparation, um, you know, the one trend that we've seen is that pretty much every year that, that, uh, we've rolled from one venue to another. Um, you know, the, the first time that, that the, our, our marquee event was in New Orleans, it came from Denver, which is the situation we're in this year. And we saw an uptick of, a, of 800 registrants. Um, another time that it went to New Orleans, I think it came from San Diego. Again, it was about an 800 registrant bump. Another time it came to New Orleans from Nashville, a little more than 800 bump. And then the last time it was in New Orleans was 2017, and um, it came from uh, Vancouver, and that that actually bumped up by 1,400. So mm. there's been a minimum of a bump up of about 800 delegates in each of the previous times that that we've had an event in New Orleans like this. So um, you know, as as we're looking at the registration numbers, um, they're not tracking at that point right now, and that's typically because this is 
you know, we have a, a large audience in the Gulf Coast region, and so it's kind of like a home game for people. So um, looking at the data, we've typically seen a lot more on-site registrations or later registrations because people can, can do that because it's a little bit easier to make those arrangements. But uh, really, for all those reasons, New Orleans has really been a, a good venue for this event. So relative to last year from a content perspective, I think the differences between New Orleans and Denver as a destination, the climatology, those types of things are obvious. But in terms of the content, the networking, what type of feedback did you get after your most recent event, which again was about a year ago in Denver? And what are some of the new things in 2024 relative to 2023 that you've incorporated based on that feedback? Yeah, I, I think the, the one thing to keep in mind about last year, I, I think a big driver for 2023 was people were just ready to get back out. You know, mm. everything had been on lockdown. Sure. Uh, in 2022, you still had to wear a mask to go to on the plane. There were COVID waivers you had to sign, hotels you had to wear a mask. So it was almost like a uh, liberating experience for people to be able to go somewhere in 2023. So that really was one of the driving forces. For New Orleans this year, I think it's a little bit different. I think it's definitely a, a lot more familiar. Um, there's always more of a reunion-y type feel. Um, you know, the one thing that I just marvel at with our our industry and our constituency, they really enjoy each other's company. They like to get together. They like to, you know, share best practices, information, catch up on things. And that's the one thing that, that this venue creates for us with, with our annual conference this year. So I think the familiarity of having a lot of our, our members and customers in that, that Gulf region is, is a big thing. And I think it also lends itself well to a lot of the industries we serve. I mean, certainly you have you know, the oil and gas industry, you've got, you know, offshore. Um, but, you know, that said, it's not a, it's not a difficult travel for people that are tied up in a lot of the other areas we serve with the, you know, obviously with the Marine and uh, mm -hmm. infrastructure and a lot of the government activities, uh, whether it be DOD or, or DOT or Department of Energy type activities. So um, it really does lend itself well. You spoke to the level of interest earlier, and as far as the actual registrations, because of the locations, I know that's likely to be a little bit late with this being a so-called home game, as you put it, for a lot of AMP members. As far as the exhibit hall, what are you seeing there as far as, I guess, the trends with interest, the new features that are there in 2024? Just from an exhibit perspective, what are you seeing on that front? Yeah, the the one thing about the exhibit is it's been very steady. I mean, that's the one thing when I came into this role in June of 2022, the one thing that I was really impressed about was uh, how healthy the exhibit has been and, uh, you know, how consistent it has been. Um, it's It's been in that 350 to 425 exhibitor range, depending on where the, the event's been at. And again, typically you see a little bit of a bump up in, in New Orleans. Um, currently, we have 361 exhibitors, and that's tracking a little bit ahead of last year. I think it was 350-ish at this point last year. Um, and we were, we actually saw exhibitors coming into the event <clears throat> up until the last two, three weeks beforehand. So I know our sales team, Tiffany Krevix and Diane Gross, along with our marketing colleagues, Ashley Woolridge and Zulema Montemir, they've been out really um, – doing a good job promoting things. And I, I would anticipate that we will see, um, you know, a fair amount of exhibitors and sponsors come in up until the last couple of weeks. Uh, again, you have close proximity, so it's a little easier for people to do that. But um, from from the standpoint of the number of exhibitors and and the size of the square footage, it's all, you know, right in line with where we would expect it to be a, a nice, good, healthy exhibit hall. And what's new on the show floor itself? For example, I think you've expanded the eye theaters, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, yeah, the amphitheaters. We added a third one this year. Okay. And so um, the one thing that we heard uh, a bit about is um, adding more what what uh, has been termed soft skills content. Mm -hmm. um, so <laughs> especially geared at small businesses, uh, contractors in particular. Um, so there's some pretty unique sessions that are going to go on, <clears throat> excuse me, in those theaters this year. Um, one is, is uh, marketing tactics for small businesses in a digital world. 
So we'll have a, a session on that. We have another one on unleashing the power of video and your marketing strategy. So again, these are not things that would be typically seen in one of our, our session rooms, but you know, this is something that could really be of relevance. If you think about those small businesses that don't have the resources, I mean, heck for an organization like ours, you know, we, we are always looking, how can we get better at these things? So I can only imagine what it's like for a small business that doesn't have some of the resources that we do. And then one thing we added this year that we thought was really relevant, and I, I got to give a shout out to Andy Shingledecker. He is um, on our conference and events program committee, uh, and he's the task force chair of uh, sponsorships and exhibits. And he's been working with some people on my staff, Alina Blanco, Sam Burrill, Sherry McCaskey, to really look at how can we increase the value for exhibitors. And so, you know, we have a lot of 10 by 10 exhibitors. There's certainly a lot of large booths out there and that's what everybody, you know, hey, let, let's go look at the big stuff out there, kick the tires, things like mm -hmm. that. But there are a, long, a, a large number of, of smaller exhibitors. Doesn't mean they're small companies, but they might have a smaller booth, 10 by 10. And so we added a session this year called Winning at Trade Shows, Tactics for Business Growth. And it's really, you know, a session to, to help our exhibitors and those that aren't exhibiting to take a look at ways that they can improve their experience and really do a better job at trade shows in general, not just the AMP trade show. And again, the work that Andy's been doing, he's been reaching across adjacencies. So he's looked at areas like the, the uh, waste and refuse area. He's looking at other, you know, material spaces that, you know, are in our wheelhouse, but maybe, you know, not something that everybody thinks of at at uh, first pass. So, you know, what, what can we do in the plastic space to bring more uh, mm -hmm. from that area or from some of the, the other uh, alloys and metals and things of that nature? So, um, you know, looking more so into the drill down materials area as opposed to as, as the asset. So, you know, the, the thinking that Andy's brought to it is, is that if we can introduce some companies and some industries into the event, uh, and and you know get some interest from them. It's an, it's a way to grow the the exhibit in other areas. So you know we're looking at long term. You know is there an opportunity to maybe bring some pavilions into the into the mix and things of that nature. So mm. you know this is kind of the beginning stages of that. And um, they've been doing a really good job of reaching out and trying to reach across the aisles, working with entities like uh, American Welding Society and others to to really you know find those areas where maybe there's multi-certification individuals, somebody who has a certification from AMP, but also has maybe a certification from AWS. And, and so where are those people where there's a crossover and that we can generate some interest? So in terms of the conference itself and the more education-oriented events that are gonna be taking place in New Orleans, I know there's a lot of excitement there as well. You recently announced your keynote speaker. I know you're getting ready to announce the Whitney Award winner, which there will be a corresponding Whitney lecture to go with that. Just speak to some of the highlights from a conference and education perspective, what people can look for outside of the exhibit hall. Yeah, there's the one thing I, I, I want to touch on a little bit, just going back to what you had mentioned earlier about past feedback. O over the first couple of years of the AMP annual conference, um, we've gotten some feedback from contractors about how can we bring some some content tied to them, um, some coatings type content. And so certainly there's some things that we've done this year. Uh, we've got the Coatings Pro Contractor Awards on Monday. Um, we've added case studies. We heard a lot about case studies. So there's a session on uh, case history of few uh, four viewpoints. Uh, brings in an owner perspective, contractor perspective, and an inspector perspective, and coatings manufacturer manufacturer perspective. And so uh, that looks to be like a, a pretty interesting session. We've got some quality assurance and third-party inspection services content. There's a forum on that. Um, there's a forum on how to gain an edge with coatings contractor selection, uh, a coatings failure symposia. Um, we've got a, another case st study on wax coating and primer. Um, from Trenton, Frank Rampton's doing that one. Um, and then again, I mentioned those kind of soft skills. So, so those were all kind of in the mix. But as, as you look at the, you know, the 2024 program, um, Stephen Reinstatler was talking with uh, some of the leadership from the AMP Global Center board. And, you know, he was kind of sharing with them some areas where new content was coming in. So um, 
There's, there's a session on uh, alternative access for at height projects. We started to see some of that last year. Uh, and that, again, that was Andy Shingledecker trying to bring something new. That was an amphitheater session last year. And so that's now going to be in a regular session rooms and really looking at, you know, alternative access type of uh, technologies and, and solutions. AMP recently signed an MOU with AWWA. And so um, that is something that we're building on. So you'll see some content tied to that. We have some new content around artificial intelligence that's tied to blast cleaning. Uh, I mentioned earlier about some of the robotics. Um, our keynote is on artificial intelligence. The, the carbon capture and storage, we're seeing a big interest there. Um, uh, Elaine Bowman has been instrumental in bringing some of that content together. A real interest around sustainability topics, um, emerging fuels, hydrogen, the concrete rein, uh, reinforced fuel concrete structures that I mentioned earlier, that, that's mm -hmm. something that's new. And um, really, the, the, the big thing, I think, is um, some of the things around the defense and military. We, we have seen a couple of pop up there. And then we've also seen some corrosion and coatings interest from the automotive industry. So we have a new session this year tied to corrosion and coatings on automotive. So, you know, those adjacencies that Andy was working on, we're also trying to do that on the technical program side. So it, it's interesting to see these things kind of come together, not the typical things that you would always see. We've got some things on aerospace. Obviously, we've got some maritime and, and some marine type activities. So uh, a good variety. And as I said, I think our attendees are really going to have a difficult time picking out what they want to go to. Keynote speech is Monday afternoon, March 4th, just prior to the opening of the exhibit hall, correct? It is Dr. Michio Kaku, and um, yep. he's going to be talking about uh, the impact of artificial intelligence on the workplace. And we've had a really strong reaction and response to his announcement as the keynote speaker. Um, it's been funny. I, I've had quite a few people reach out to me saying, hey, we've you know watched all his programs on, I think he was on Discovery Channel and that they've watched a lot of his YouTube videos and read all his books. And, you know, there's there's a, a, a lot of interest in people wanting to, you know, have an opportunity to meet Dr. Kaku. And mm -hmm. so, um, you know, we're, we're real excited to see uh, the reaction to this. Now, you know, he's he's a real um, highly technical individual, but he's done a really good job of connecting the technical with how it impacts everyday life. And so um, I, I really think uh, for those that are maybe thinking, hey, this might be a little over my head, I hope they give it a chance because he, he's a, a really interesting speaker. He does a really good job. And uh, he, I, I think he has a couple of million followers on his YouTube channel. I mean, he oh, really wow. does have a strong reach out there. So we're yep. really excited by uh, Dr. Kaku being able to join us on Monday. Yeah, the event taking place from March 3rd through the 7th in New Orleans. If you want more info, you can go to ace.amp.org, ace.amp.org, or you can download the AMP annual app, which has an updated schedule. Beyond education, beyond the exhibit hall, there's also a lot of networking and social activities that take place in connection to an event like this because you're bringing people, really the entire industry, hopefully, together in an event that celebrates all of AMP membership. So I know there's a lot of work that you and your teams and other people throughout our staff have worked hard to put together. You've got things like awards night, the Gen Next Bash. You've got obviously the exhibit hall opening. You've got the golf tournament. You've got the Amp Cares Volunteer Day. There's a lot of events that don't take place actually in a forum room or on the show floor, but are still a very valuable part of the AMP annual experience each year. So just speak to some of the networking opportunities sure. and the broader social component to this year's conference. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you're, you're spot on. The, the networking is, is a key element of the event, Get, getting together and being able to connect with others. And certainly, you know, the golf outing that, that supports our eMERGE activities, that's that's one way to do that. Um, and that's that's a whole day long activity on uh, on Sunday, I believe. Um, we also you mentioned the opening reception Carboline and AMP co-sponsor that uh, that happens on Sunday evening. Um, we do have the the exhibit grand opening and reception that is sponsored by Sherwin Williams, and that'll happen on uh, Monday. 
And just prior to that will be the uh, the Codings Pro Awards happen right outside the exhibit hall as well. So the Codings Pro Awards will be presented and then we'll have the grand opening. Um, there's a career fair on Tuesday. Um, one of the initiatives that started up last year that I'm really excited about is the, the women of Ant, uh, Joyce Wright and uh, Rochelle Rigby. Uh, who, Rochelle is the vice chair of the Conference and Events Program Committee. And obviously Joyce Wright is a past chair of the AMP Global Center. Uh, they they started a, a kickoff meeting. They basically had a, just an open session and it was an open invitation. Anybody who was interested to come and talk about, you know, what could or should the women of AMP be for the AMP organization. And they were, you know, we had a room set for maybe 50 people. They weren't expecting much more than that. And, and they had over 100 individuals come to that session. It was standing room only. They got a lot of momentum and it's really kind of snowballed. And and Joyce and Rochelle have been working along on that. And um, so this year they're going to have a breakfast on Tuesday morning. And um, so I'm I'm really anxious to see what they've been working on and how things are coming along for them. Um, there's a headshot station that's sponsored by Tinker and Razor. That's on mm -hmm. Tuesday. That'll be on the second floor. And that's a great opportunity for, especially for young professionals, anybody coming new. I mean, it's great for anybody, but for, for somebody who doesn't really have a professional photo that they can use on their LinkedIn profile or, you know, use for as their, uh, you know, in their professional endeavors, um, it's a great opportunity to get that. And, you know, a lot of us, you know, <laughs> some of us that are a little old, uh, been around a little longer, maybe have a little less hair, or a little uh, lighter color hair than we did um, you know, maybe it looks like we have our high school picture up there. Oh, nice. <laughs> and so it's an opportunity to get that picture updated, if you like, and and show a little bit of that seasoning, if you will. So, you know, that's always a nice a nice sponsorship. And I know Tinker and Razor's always been proud of doing that. They they really enjoy doing that one. So um, that that's a really good one. Uh, you mentioned the, the Emerge Leaders Bash. That one's sponsored by Sherwin-Williams and BP, and that's always a great time. But another thing that we have going on, and again, th this is uh, Elaine Bowman and, and a group that she's been working with, something new this year. It's, it's actually not new. It's a, it's a transition of something that has happened in the past, and they just kind of rebranded it, is uh, a Valuing Voices Breakfast. And um, there, this, this was something that has happened in the past, talking about diversity, equity, and inclusion. And, um, you know, they, they came up with, I can't remember where the term came from, but I guess there was a group of people talking about things. And, and so this valuing voices kind of tagline evolved. And, um, so that, that's a breakfast that's going to happen on Wednesday. Um, so that, that's, a, a something that I think is going to have a lot of value. And then we've got the honoree night, as, as you mentioned on Wednesday, and I'm really excited for that event. That that's a fantastic venue. You know, I mentioned earlier about that, you know, we've got so many wonderful AMP members and volunteers that contribute so much to the organization. And, you know, this is that one time a year that we really have an opportunity to thank them and celebrate them and, and really recognize all the hard work that goes into it. And, you know, it, it's tough. I, I'll tell you, you know, there's a lot of things that we do in building this conference where, you know, it. it impacts our members in a great way and you know it's always a struggle because there's so many things going on there's so many conflicting activities so many competing activities you know everybody wants to be on either monday or tuesday with their presentation but you know somebody's got to go sunday somebody's got to go thursday it's like how do you balance this all juggle this all and you know sometimes our members can feel like they're lost or they're not appreciated and so this honoree night is that that one night to really you know, thank them and recognize them. And, and I hope that uh, a lot of our members will come and support their, their fellow members and, and recognize them for these great contributions. When we talk about the members and the potential attendees at AMP Annual this year, or any year for that matter, what are some of the common questions that they have and what are some of the answers to those? Use this, if you could, as your sort of forum for the FAQs, the frequently asked questions yeah. that you hear when people reach out to events or conferences about what's going to be happening on the ground. Yeah, you, usually we hear about, um, you know, when when do the pricing uh, deadlines kick in? And, and that's already passed. The advanced pricing deadline for this year was January 5th. Uh, so we're a little bit earlier in the year than we were last year. So that deadline's already come and gone. So that was a question that we were getting up until that point. But um, we've also gotten a few questions around this year. One one big change is there will not be an on-site printed final program based on feedback that we've had and 
collaboration with other business units and thinking about sustainability type initiatives that the organization has been undertaking. We're going to have uh, all of the program content will be within the conference app. So uh, no printed program on site, but all the same information is available in the conference app. And the real benefits to our, our members, and this is the questions that we've been being asked about, well, what what will be in there? Is it going to be you know live and up to date? And that really is the beauty of this is that, you know, once we printed the, the, the final program that went in print, the minute we printed it, it was outdated. Couldn't do anything about changing yes. it. And, and in this case, if we get last minute changes, we're able to go into the app, make it on the fly, and it's, it's live right, right then and there. Um, the other thing is, is that it has allowed us to sync up the app with the conference schedule that's on the website. And in previous years, we got a lot of feedback that people like that, that conference schedule portion of the website, but it wasn't syncing with the app. This year, it does that. So this change allows us to be synced up with the schedule. It allows things to be uh, right in place. Now, there will be, we're, we're using the term uh, an on-site brochure. There will be about a 12 to 14 page printed piece that we'll have. That will have all the kind of general conference information. It'll okay. it'll have, you know, the, the uh, ethics issues that we have, the, you know, the, the announcements tied to ethics and behavior. It'll have the floor maps of the convention center. It'll have, uh, you know, the, the, the general information um, so that there will be some, you know, piece that people have that gives them some general information. But all the, the content information, all the session information, that's all going to be running through the app. It'll be live. If there's any changes, it'll be cha it, it'll you know happen automatically. And we you know people who have been frustrated in past years when they planned on going to a session and there might have been a change and they didn't find out until they got to the room. If they're checking that app, if there's any changes, they'll see that you know on the fly. So that's one thing. A couple of other things that we get some questions around. We get quite a few people who come to us and say, hey, I've, I've had an entity that's reached out to me and said they have the AMP attendee list and they're they're offering to sell it to me. Is this a legit thing? And we tell them all the time, no, that is not. AMP does not sell its attendee lists. There are, unfortunately, scammers out there who I, I don't know where they get lists or how they get information, but they, I, I can't tell you how many emails I get about other events where these same people are trying to same. sell me lists from other events. Yep. And that that's just one that's, you know, if anybody gets that, that is not from AMP. And similarly, around our hotel room block, we've partnered with an entity called Spargo. They're the official housing provider for AMP. And so if anybody gets any kind of solicitations about hotels that are not from Spargo, that's another scam that's out there. So we do get some questions around those. Um, but beyond that, it's just the general, you know, where can I find the information? And you mentioned the website earlier. That website is a great resource to go to, and it has all the latest and greatest. So between the website and the conference app, anything you need to know is there. Yeah, I can definitely speak to the value of the app as a personal anecdote in late 2021 i took over the show daily responsibilities i'm the editor the coordinator that arranges everything we do as far as our conference newsletter which is sent out by email but it's also available through that conference website ace.amp.org and basically what that is it's previews it's recaps it's news coverage of what's going on at conference for people who want to know what events to hit up themselves or if they don't have time to hit up every event they can get a high level overview of what took place along with some photos and videos as well. And so I started doing that in 2021. And when I started, I tried to use the print programs, but what I found was that, and it was especially the case back then because there were so many late changes due to issues related to COVID, that basically you could never be on top from a timing perspective. You could never catch up in print with what was up to date. And when I finally just started saying, you know what, I'm gonna go to the app and look at digital only, that made all the difference because the information for me in terms of planning what events were happening, what events that I was going to cover or have our team cover as part of our show daily news coverage. Again, once we transitioned 100% to the app, the accuracy was pretty perfect. As opposed to when it's printed, I know we don't have the COVID concerns now that we did a couple of years ago, but the reality is things always change. There's always one or two little tweaks that need to be made at the last moment. And 
just directing people to the app ensures that you're not going to have anyone going on outdated information. The app is how you know it's going to be 100% up to date and reflective of what's actually going to happen on the ground. Absolutely. All right. I think that's everything I wanted to cover. Uh, Greg, before we sign off, for anyone listening who may have further questions for you or your team, what's the best way they can get in touch with you or anyone else from uh, conferences or events? Yeah, sure. From the website, there's a, a list of contacts and, and my team is listed there. But uh, for, for me, anybody's welcome to email me directly. My email is greg.muha, that's G-R-E-G dot M-U-H-A at amp.org. Um, for general questions around the conference activities, Sherry McCaskey from our team is the person that can be reached out to. That's uh, Sherry.McCaskey, S-H-E-R-R-Y dot M-C-C-A-S-K-E-Y at amp.org. And then for the exhibits, uh, Sam Burrill is our senior manager of exhibits. Um, they can email him at Sam Burrill, S-A-M dot B-A-R-I-L-L at amp.org. And uh, they'd be happy to answer any other questions. I mentioned earlier that we'll probably see some exhibitors come in. Anybody who may be interested in purchasing an exhibitor or sponsorship, they can reach out to Tiffany Krevix. Uh, same thing, Tiffany.Krevix, that's T-I-F-F-A-N-Y dot K-R-E-V-I-C-S at amp.org. And Tiffany would be happy to help them. Sounds good. All right, well, we will break it here. As we mentioned a few times, the best place to get information in the immediate term would simply be by going to ace.amp.org. That's the conference website, and you can find both scheduling details as well as contact information. Simply going to the conference website is your best bet at this point in time and leading up to the event on the ground in March or on the ground in New Orleans come early March. Greg, thanks so much for taking the time. Have a good day. You too, Ben. We'll wrap it here for Greg. I'm Ben. As always, we appreciate you, our listeners, so much for tuning in. And if you want more resources from us at AMP beyond simply the conference, you can go to amp.org or our publication websites, materialsperformance.com, codingsformag.com, for all the updated industry news related to this conference and beyond anything related to corrosion mitigation and prevention, protective coatings. We cover all niches within the industry. So check out our publication websites as well as the association's website at amp.org. All right, with those plugs complete, we can adjourn. For Greg Muha, I'm Ben Dubose. Appreciate you all for listening, and please come back soon for another new AMP podcast.